Audrey. Audrey, you may need to un Hello? Yeah, there you go. I was just going to say you may need to unmute your microphone. Um, yeah, this is Yeah, they have they've made the go to meeting program so that everybody that logs in is muted until they unmute it. Huh. Okay. Sorry, I'm a few minutes late. The roads are a little slick out. I almost, oh, didn't, yeah. almost didn't get home in time. Um, I have, I, I realized uh, that I took pictures of your four pages of pre-calc review. Uh -huh. I have them. Do you, you want to work on those? Uh, that'll keep you from having to send me anything. Yes. Okay, or you can just verbalize stuff, but if it's easier, to, in other words, I've got these four pages, review A, B, C, and D. Um, I just need to work on the last two pages. Okay, let's pull up C here. Wow, must have been shaken when I took this picture. I don't think it's that one. I think it's 23 through 40. Good. <laughs> uh, that must be D. I think it's the A and B. Oh, I got it wrong. Yeah. I, I know. I know what I get. I, this is so. B is probably the second to last. Why, yes, that one. why are my pictures so blurry here? Ooh. Hmm. You may have to read it for me. Um. That works too. Yeah, go ahead and let me pull up my drawing tablet and have you read it. Okay. Ah, I'm, a, I'm thinking I must have had my camera on uh, Zoom or something. Uh, yeah, go ahead and read the problem. Okay. On the same set of axes, is sketch the graph of y is equal to 3 raised to the x and y is equal to 3 m m raised to the negative x over the domain x and then it's like an absolute value sign negative 2 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 2. Like that? Yeah, except before the negative 2 there's like an absolute value or like a line and then before that is an x. Oh, I know what you mean. Is all that means is that's the domain of X. Okay. Like that, kind of? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and they just want us to graph it? Yes. Okay. Exponential functions all look like that, pretty much. In other words, that could be 3 to the X, that could be 2 to the X, that could be E to the X, that could be 100 to the X. And it's going to have a similar shape. I'm talking this one for the moment. Okay. Okay. And the thing about all these exponentials is they all go through this point, 0, 1. Why? Because whenever x is 0, any number to the 0 power is 1. So okay. that's why if I just draw that curve, I could say that's y equal 3 to the x. I could also make an argument why that might be y equals 5 to the x, or even y equals 100 to the x. In other words, the base could be pretty much anything, and it's, it's still going to look like this. In other words, it grows very rapidly as x increases to the right. Now, they wanted you to graph it from minus 2 to 2. So the only point we really need is that one right there. What is that point? Which one? The one on the left. Negative 2, 1. Negative 2, but when I plug in negative 2 for x, I don't get 1. I get 3 to the minus 2 power. What is 3 to the minus 2 power equal to? Mm -hmm. 1, um, over, 1 over 3 to the positive 2. So 1 ninth. Yeah. Negative exponents don't mean negative numbers. 
In fact, they rarely mean negative numbers. And that's the biggest mistake that most people try to do, is they try to make it negative. They see that negative exponent and they want it to be negative. But we can see here that's a positive number. It's a positive one ninth. So the coordinates on that point are minus 2 comma 1 ninth. We know that it goes through that point. Well, what is this point right here, the coordinates? 9. Okay. So there's your curve between minus 2 and 2. Okay, and that would be... 9 on your scale, and that would be 1 ninth on the vertical scale. Now, did they want you to graph these both on the same curve? On the same set of axes, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, let me... I don't really need to do anything different. Notice that this curve here is the same as 1 over... 3 to the x. So let's just plug in points. When x is minus 2, what is it? 1 ninth. No. No. This point is minus 2, 1 ninth. We're in a different function now. We're on this function here. So when I plug in minus 2, I have 1 over 3 to the minus 2. And another way to look at negative exponents is just to move it to the other side of the fraction line. So 1 over 3 to the minus 2 is the same as 3 to the positive 2 over 1. In other words, no. Yeah. So this curve has the point minus 2 comma 9 on it and it's going to go through that same point and what is this point right here? 1 ninth. That's all there is to it. And yeah, I don't know what else to say about it. Uh, the thing to notice is that when you have a negative exponent, it approaches zero as x goes to infinity. In other words, it's a reflection over the y-axis. These two curves are reflections over the y-axis of one another, as it should be, because the only difference between them is this this, if I call this f of x, well, this one is actually f of minus x. And when you do an f of minus x, that's exactly a reflection over the y-axis. If you have minus f of x, that's a reflection over the x-axis. But that's not what we have here. We have f of minus x. Okay, uh, let's see if I can read any of these. Now i got to figure out what, what's wrong with my camera. I don't, can't believe I'm shaking this much. Uh, I don't know which, I can't even read the numbers on the left. Was that 25? Oh. Uh, the first graphing one is 27. Okay, why don't you just read them to me. That, that's All right, cool. the next graphing one is sketch the graph of y is equal to 1 half x or one half raised to the x, and y is equal to two raised to the x okay. over the domain of negative three is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to three. Written the same way as the last problem. Yeah. Okay. When you're taking exponential functions, they always look like this as long as the base is greater than one. Well, this one, the base is less than 1. If the base is less than 1, they always look like this. Well, they don't go below the axis like that, but they still always go through that exact 
points. That's the key with all exponential functions is they always go through 0 comma 1 because even 1 half to the 0 power is equal to 1. But the fact that this is less than 1 means it's going to be decaying. Notice as x gets bigger, y has to get smaller. One-half squared is one-fourth. One-half cubed is one-eighth. Okay. okay. Well, let's figure up that exact point. It's one-half to the minus one or minus three power which is the same as 2 to the 3 power. And why is it the same? Well, we know that it's 1 over 1 half to the 3, right? That's, that would be the first step. But then that's 1 over 1 eighth, which is equal to 8. So I can just make that immediately 2 to the 3rd. Okay. Okay. So this is 8. And over here at plus 3, what do you figure that's going to be? 1 eighth. Right. We don't even have to do the math. And likewise, that, since 2 is greater than 1, that's going to look very much like our last function did. Our last function was 3 to the x. Well, this is 2 to the x. I can't really tell the difference between the appearances of them. They both look the same. But this is a reflection of the first graph over the y-axis once again. And so this point right here must be what? One eighth, negative three, one eighth. And this point uh, right there is going to be three comma eight. And that curve is y equal two to the x. And this curve is y equal one half to the x. So the key really is whether that base is greater than or less than one. Okay. If it's greater than 1, it's an increasing exponential function. If it's less than 1, and when I say less than 1, I really mean between 0 and 1. In other words, it, it, if it's minus 2, it's different. But if it's, as long as this base is between 0 and 1, it's going to be a decaying curve. And if it's greater than 1, it's going to be an increasing curve. Okay. Okay. Um, find all rational roots of x raised to the third minus 7x minus 6 is equal to 0. Okay. What's the rational factor theorem tell me? Um, In other words, I can't, I can't factor that, right? No. It's, I don't have any idea how to even begin factoring it. There is a method for factoring cubics, but it's about 100 times more complicated than factoring quadratics. There's no quadratic formula for cubics, okay? So when I run into a cubic that is difficult to solve, I have to use the thing called the rational factor theorem. Well, the rational factor theorem tells me that if there is a rational zero to this function, its numerator has to be what? P over Q. Does that look familiar? Kind of. Well, what the rational factor theorem says is that if there is a rational zero, and you, you know the difference between rational and irrational? Somewhat. That's rational. That's irrational. Okay. Rational means you can write it as a fraction. You cannot write that number as a fraction. 
you cannot write this number as a fraction. So both of these are irrational. 3, I can write as a fraction. It's 3 over 1. 9 fourths, that's rational. I can write it as a fraction. So when I'm talking about rational solutions, I'm talking about these kind of solutions. Okay? In other words, it's only if I have a rational solution that this P over Q business comes into play. And what P over Q means is that P, the numerator, has to be a factor of my constant. And the denominator has to be a factor of my constant of my highest degree term. So my possible p's are plus or minus 6, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3, and plus or minus 2. That's my possible numerators for any possible rational factor. Okay. My possible it, denominators are only plus or minus one. Um, is those four always the only four? No, it depends on this number. If that number oh, were, oh, that's the factors of that. If that were if this number were like twenty four, then I would have like sixteen possible oh, okay. factors. You would have to find all the factors of whatever that number is. Okay. So this tells me that my possible rational solutions are these four, only these four. If there is a rational solution, it has to come from these four. In other words, I'm not going to find a solution of four or five as a rational zero. Is the denominator always one? No. In other words, if there was a, a four in front of that, Mm -hmm. then the denominator is factors of 4. So it could be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 4, or plus or minus 2. Okay. And if I had those, then I would have to take all combinations. In other words, let's say I did have a plus or minus 2 and a plus or minus 4. Now I have to consider 6 over 2. I have to consider 1 over 2, 3 over 2. 2 over 4, 3 over 4. In other words, all combinations of fractions that you could make from that. Okay. Okay? So it's a little bit easier that my denominator is plus or minus 1 only. Because now I can eliminate it and say these are my only possible solutions. How am I going to determine which one is a solution? Synthetic division. Yeah. And when I synthetically divide these, I'm just going to do it randomly. And I'm going to put my coefficients across the top. What are my coefficients across the top going to be? 1, 0, negative 7, negative 6. Which first one should I try? Um, positive 6. You know, I always try the smallest number I, just out of habit. In other words, it's strictly a trial and error process. I have no mm -hmm. idea which one is going to be correct. So there's, I don't have any preference over 6 as opposed to 1. But what I do know is the math is easier when I do 1. And then okay. I'm going to do the minus 1, and if that doesn't produce a solution, I'm going to go to 2 and then minus 2 and then 3 and then 6. If I had some fractions... Now the math is really easy doing the whole numbers. So I'm going to leave my fractions until last to try. Okay? So let's try one. How do I do the synthetic division? Just a second. Let me move this a little bit lower here. And I'm going to put these up here. I've got plus or minus six, plus or minus one plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 3. Those are my possibilities. Just trying them randomly. How do I do the synthetic division here? Um, bring down the 1. And then it's 1. 1. Uh, 1 again. Negative 6. And negative 6. Adding? 
negative 12. So I don't really care what the number is. If it's not zero, I'm done with trying one. Okay. In other words, I am going to keep trying these until I produce a zero right there. And that's the zero remainder theorem that says that if one is a solution and I divide it into that polynomial, I have to have a remainder of zero. If I do not, then one is not a solution. So 1 is not a solution. Let's try minus 1. I know you know how to do it now, so I'll just do it real quick. Aha. So what are my two factors at this point? Negative 1. Well, what's my linear factor? It's x minus or plus something. Mm. x plus 1. In other words, if that is the solution, and we just proved that it is, then the linear factor has to be x minus a minus 1 or x plus 1. Is that the same as saying, like, x minus 1 is equal to 0, and then it would be yes, x is equal to 0? Exactly. Well, uh, yeah, let's let's find the second solution, and then I'll work backwards, and you can see it a little easier. What's this factor? Um, x squared minus x minus 6. Yeah, and that's a simple quadratic. So I'm going to, this is all equal to x plus 1 times what times what? factor that quadratic. X minus 3 plus 2. Okay. X minus 3 plus 2. So I've found, I've fully factored it. I found all three zeros. Notice that all three zeros fit, you know, I got one at minus 1, I got another at 3, and I got another at minus 2. So if I started out telling you those were my three factors, you'd be able to tell me my three zeros, right? Correct. So if I start out telling you what my zeros are, you should be able to tell me my three linear factors. In other words, you want to be able to go both ways on that. Okay. Okay. And that's why what goes in the box when you're doing synthetic division is the zero. It's not this. In other words, x plus 1 is the linear factor that indicates a 0 is minus 1. So it's basically just the opposite of what you synthetically divided? Uh, not always. Um, if this were 2x minus 3, oh, then it would be... Then the 0 would be 3 halves. Okay. Okay? So it's only the opposite if that coefficient is 1 then you okay. can take the opposite sign of that for your zero. But okay. the real thing we're doing here is we're setting that equal. In other words, I got three things that are multiplying together and they're equaling zero. That is only possible if that is zero, that is zero, or that is zero. So I basically set each of those equal to zero. I say x plus 1 equals zero, and that gives me my zero of minus 1. I said x minus 3 equals 0. That gives me the 0 of 3. And this other one gives me a 0 of minus 2. Okay. So if I would have synthetically divided by any of these three numbers, it would have worked. In other words, I could have actually started with minus 2 or plus 3 or minus 1, and all of them would have produced this 0 remainder. And that's the exact process that you have to go through to solve a cubic like this. You just have to define what your possible zeros are, and then you just have to start trying them until you find one that works. And, and usually if you start with a cubic, is all you have to do is find one that works. Because when you find one that works, what you're left over with is a quadratic. It's always one degree less. And 
you don't need any extra help to solve quadratics. You can always use the quadratic formula if it doesn't factor nicely. Okay. Okay. So getting it down to a linear factor and a quadratic is kind of the objective. If you start with a quartic, then you want to find two linear factors and a quadratic. In other okay. words, you keep whittling the polynomial down until you end up with a quadratic as the biggest degree, because you can always handle a quadratic. You know, you don't need synthetic division or any of that. You just use the quadratic formula if you want. Okay. Okay. All right. We might have time for one more. I don't know. I'm. I, I started a little late, so I don't want to shortchange you. But I do have another session at 7. But that's the, my final one of the day, so I can go a little bit longer with them, right. I think. I just have a couple questions on logs. Okay. So evaluate log base 2 of 18. Okay. Let's talk about logs real quick. Any discussion on logs needs to begin here. What is the equivalent logarithmic expression? of that that I just wrote, y equal b to the x. Log what? Log. Let me give you one hint, and it's a great one. It's the only thing you need to remember about logs. Logs are exponents. Okay? Okay. If logs are exponents, then what has to be on the other side of this equal sign? Uh, X. Where does the B go? After the log. Always down there. The only other place for the Y is up there. Okay? So, if I had 8 equals 2 cubed, and I want to write that logarithmically, how would I write it? Log base 2 of 8 is equal to 3. Okay. So now if you start there and want to work backwards, it's always this raised to this power equals the number in the middle. So let's make up a variable for that. And now to solve it, let's convert it to exponential format. This is exponential format. This is logarithmic format. They're identical. This means this. So you want to be able to go back and forth. You want to be able to always take a logarithmic expression and convert it to exponential, because sometimes that's the best way to solve it. And you also want to be able to take an exponential expression and convert it to logarithmic. So okay. what is that expression? Um, 2 raised to the x is equal to 18. Yeah. And obviously x is not an integer. Because 2 to the 4th is 16, 2 to the 5th is 32. So you would need a calculator to solve this. But actually, your calculator wouldn't solve this, but your calculator would solve that. In other words, your calculator is going to let you figure out the log base 2 of 18. It will give you a number for that. What kind of calculator do you have, Audrey? Is it an Inspire? Um, no, it's an 84. Okay. Well, with an 84, you'd have to change that to... Um, log base 10. Yeah, well, the change of base formula. In other words, log base 2 of 18 is the same as log of 18 divided by log of 2. So that's what you'd put into your calculator. Was this a calculator question? It must have been. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't need to go through all that stuff then. I'm sorry for wasting time, but this is very, this is actually the starting point of logs. If you if you don't know this, then you need to to know that. Absolutely. Um, every, every discussion of logs has to begin with these two things being identical. Okay. Okay. All right. I didn't realize that was a calculator question.
I thought, for one thing, I thought it was going to end up being a nice integer. In other words, if I gave you this problem, what's that equal to? Um, 2 raised to the x is equal to 16. So what is x? Um, 4. 2 to the 4th is 16. In other words, I can solve this problem without a calculator, only because x is an integer. All right. All right, one more. Uh, Audrey, I'm going to have to go. Uh, it, okay. I'm just I'm four minutes late for my appointment. So um, if it's really important, I can call you back in a half an hour and finish. finish. No, it's fine. It's like the other ones, and I have the key. So. Okay, cool. Audrey, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and I maybe we'll talk to you next year, I guess, huh? Yeah. Okay. Have a good night. Have a good one. Bye-bye.